Why should you care about quantum computing? My name is Benjamin Schiffer and I'm a researcher in the theory division of the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics in Garchin near Munich. In this Quantum Minutes video, I will tell you what makes quantum computing so fascinating. I will tell you whether quantum computers can solve all problems faster than classical computers and whether they might help us solve the climate crisis. Thinking about what we can do with quantum computers means thinking about algorithms. So in this episode, we'll talk about quantum algorithms. An algorithm is a set of instructions for a computer that enables the computer to solve a certain problem. In this video here, I want to talk about two very particular problems that are crucial to understand the impact that quantum computers might have. Our first problem is one that is very well known among quantum computing researchers. Let's talk about nitrogen fertilizers. Nitrogen fertilizers have been key to improve agricultural yields in the 20th century and secure a stable food supply for billions of people. However, the Haber-Bosch process to make these fertilizers is quite energy hungry. This process alone is responsible for 1-2% to of the global greenhouse gas emissions. There exists an alternative way in nature that is not as energy intensive. However, in order to replicate it, we would need to understand it first. And analyzing these processes is a very hard problem. It would take the best classical supercomputers literally forever to simulate the quantum mechanical effects in these chemical reactions. And we do not expect any classical algorithm to ever being able to change that. We would like an algorithm to analyze chemical reactions. And we would like algorithms for many more problems where classical computers struggle. Algorithms can not only be invented for classical computers, but also for a radically new type of computer, the quantum computer. Quantum mechanics is very special and counterintuitive. Let me explain to you two of the most important quantum mechanical effects. First, superposition. A classical bit can be either zero or one, or heads or tails on a coin. A quantum bit, short qubit, however, can be heads and tails at the same time. So it's a bit like if I spin this coin really, really fast, you see both. Only when I measure, it has to decide whether it's actually heads or tails. This is, of course, a much simplified version of a qubit. Scientists usually think of a qubit as a sphere, a Bloch sphere, where heads or tails correspond to north and south pole of the sphere, which many more states in between. Second is entanglement. When two qubits are entangled, that means that they're perfectly correlated in what they show when you measure them. What does that mean? That means you either see heads or tails on both of the qubits. That's true even if you put one qubit on the moon and one stays on Earth. What you measure is still random, but if you see heads on the moon, you will also measure heads on Earth. These phenomena are super fascinating on its own. But what if we could build a computer that harnesses these effects in order to have faster algorithms to solve problems in a better way than classical computers can do? This is what researchers in quantum algorithms are doing. We want to invent new algorithms that make use of the laws of quantum mechanics such as entanglement and superposition, to find the solutions to problems faster. We want to find a low energy alternative for making nitrogen fertilizers. And in fact, there is a quantum algorithm called quantum simulation. Quantum simulation enables us to analyze the properties of complex molecules and chemical reactions. And with that newly gained knowledge, we would then be able to use it for the applications that we're interested in. Here, have to make an important distinction. There's actually two approaches to quantum simulation, and that's analog quantum simulation and digital quantum simulation. In analog quantum simulation, one actually builds a toy system in the lab that shares some important properties with the quantum system that we want to learn about. Analog quantum simulation is already very successful, and if you're interested, please check out a video from my colleague Karn where they build optical lattices made from lasers in order to do analog quantum simulation. Now, a much more flexible way 
to do quantum simulation is digital quantum simulation using a digitally programmable quantum processor. Just like your laptop is able to run many different programs without the need to rewire the processor, a programmable quantum computer can also run many different programs and it can do a quantum simulation for different kinds of molecules or solids. So it's very flexible in that regard. Different techniques have been proposed to do that. And if you're a little bit familiar with quantum computing, you might already have heard about them. There's product formulas, quantum walks, and quantum signal processing. Each of these techniques give a precise recipe of how quantum simulation is executed on such a device. Digital quantum simulation will in fact enable us to analyze the low energy way to make nitrogen fertilizers. And I think that's amazing. It's possible because digital quantum simulation runs much faster than any classical algorithm would be able to do. It runs in polynomial time, while classical algorithms require exponential time. Polynomial and exponential, what does it really mean? Let's continue with the second problem where I'll make this difference more clear to you. The second problem is much different at first, and it sounds like a purely mathematical problem. However, it has profound implications for the internet as we know it. It has to do with multiplying and factoring numbers. We're going to ask to factor a number into its primes. And let's start with a very easy example, 15. Let's take the number 15 and ask ourselves what are the prime factors. You will know that 15 is 3 times 5, so that was easy. And 3 and 5 cannot be factored further. But what about a larger number? What about 143? Now, this is a little bit more difficult, but you will eventually find out that 143 is 11 times 13. In fact, if we make the numbers longer, the computational time required scales exponentially. Let's say for every digit, there's a factor of 10 that the runtime takes longer now. Then for 1003, we might have been at one millisecond, something that's very, very quick on a computer. For this number here, we would already be at two and a half hours to come up with the prime factors. If we only add four more digits, the same computation would already require three years now to give us a result. Adding more digits will quickly take the age of the universe for a very large problem. And these are problems that we also call intractable because there's simply no way for very large problems to get a result in time. This is fundamentally different from a polynomial scaling where it might take a while to get a result but it's usually possible. And here comes the magic of Schur's algorithm. Schur's algorithm actually provides a polynomial algorithm to solve the problem of factoring numbers for a quantum computer. Now, this quantum speed up that we have in factoring is fascinating. But you might wonder, how is this relevant for you? And the answer is that this is really important for many services on the internet. VPN, online banking, and online payment using credit cards rely on encryption. One very important encryption method used for that is the asymmetric encryption called RSA. RSA relies on the fact that a classical computer has a very hard time finding the prime factors of a given number. Within the next decades, quantum computers will be able to solve the factoring problem using Schur's algorithm. This will break RSA. Because encryption is so crucial for our everyday lives, there's currently a race going on for quantum-safe encryption methods, such as lattice-based encryption. Or we would use quantum key distribution. Quantum cryptography is another great topic. Please check out the video of my colleague Lucas up here. You might have wondered why I spent so much time in explaining these two algorithms. It's because they are really special in achieving an exponential quantum speedup. Quantum computers will make it possible to solve the problem of factoring and analyzing complex molecules. For a classical computer, this would not just have taken more time, but for large problems, 
would have been completely impossible. This is a game changer. However, quantum algorithms can provide a speed up for some problems, but not for all. And if you take only one thing from this Quantum Minutes video, then it's the following. Quantum computers are not a silver bullet to make all problems easy and all calculations super fast. They can provide a speed up for some problems, but not to all. Importantly, quantum computers do not work by looking at all possible solutions in parallel. Because if they were, you would be able to solve every problem in an instant. And that is not true. So what about quantum computers to combat climate change? We could use quantum computers to invent new green technology. But there's one big problem with that. Quantum computing is still a very young field and it will still take many years in order to have a large quantum computer that would be required in order to run the algorithms that I talked about. Climate change, however, is happening now and the clock is literally ticking to go to net zero as fast as possible. Even if, with the help of quantum computers, we would find new and sustainable prototypes for nitrogen fertilizers, for carbon storage, bring these techniques to market usually takes many years, which might simply be too late. Researchers in quantum algorithms, like me and my colleagues, work hard on improving existing algorithms and inventing new ones. The big question for us right now is, can we find algorithms that work well not only on large fault-tolerant quantum computers without noise in the future, but that are useful already now? My current research is on adiabatic algorithms and variational algorithms, which are among the most promising candidates for early noisy quantum devices. This is something that we pursue research on right here in Munich at the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics and the Munich Center for Quantum Science and Technologies. If you liked our video, please check out also the other Quantum Minute videos up here.